I'm John Laker, um, one of the directors of Mardo Energy Group, and I will be um, doing the MC job during this evening. Um, the format is basically a talk from Bean um, and then some questions, preferably put them in chat, but if but there's not enough in chat or there's not many of them, we can um, take questions from the floor at the end. But before we do that, I just want to do a quick introduction with regard to MEG, so you know what we're all about. So here we go. First of all, a welcome slide. Let's get people out of the way. Introduction to Milo Energy Group. We're a not-for-profit community benefits society, basically a cooperative. We have four, I think, objectives. Make Milo a net zero carbon town. Facilitate knowledge exchange, effective networking collaboration. Develop, invest in renewable energy schemes support local share ownership and opportunities for local businesses. You can read this just as well as I can, but we do need volunteers. And if you wish to join us, if you're not a member, it's a whole 10 pounds. And you can also make a donation on the website if you don't want to become a member. So we're going to introduce uh, Bean Bean land in a minute. Over to Bean, over to you Bean. Uh, looks good, thank you very much indeed, uh, John. Um, no, look, thank you everyone. Uh, select ban, but that's good. Uh, it means you'll have plenty of time to pose, uh, pose questions um, afterwards. And I, I hope you'll have lots, because I don't, I don't really want any of these sort of talks that we're doing with community groups to be just a lecture. Uh, it's it's vitally important that we also learn from community groups such as yours. You know what what are what are people thinking? You know what what's your current view on the whole issue about decarbonisation? Obviously, from our perspective, heat pumps, electrification, as we call it, in in particular. Um, but it's really important that we we stay connected. It's one of the reasons why we're so keen to do as many of these talks as we can. Uh, and I must tell you, we're doing this sort of thing at the rate of about once a week at the moment, uh, all around the country. Uh, so I think it's a really good way of keeping in touch with what consumers are, are really, really thinking. So I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. So thank you. Um, John, I can't remember. We, 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 was it uh, over two years ago, maybe, when we did our first one of these? I think it was about 18 months ago. About 18 months. Um, so just to <clears throat> give you a bit of an update... A bit of a positive update, I actually met someone through that first talk for Mallo who had a problem with an air source heat pump in a new build property. Uh, uh, he had been struggling with both the developer and with LHBC, the building insurer. Uh, we got involved and I'm pleased to report his system was completely replaced about six months after we got involved, free of charge for him. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's a good news, that's a good news story. On a, <clears throat> on a heat pump solution that hadn't been done that well. There's obviously been a lot of development too on, on in, uh, uh, I would say, development in policy. We've had a lot of more talk, but not a lot of massive development in policy. But what we have had, of course, in the last 12 months is um, a considerable shift in the energy and um, that whole landscape for, for energy, particularly fossil fuels. Um, and those implications for all of us. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we've just come out of COP27. Um, so look, I, this is an update, really. I don't know how many of you were on the first, uh, first talk, so there will be a degree of repeat, but I hopefully there's a, enough new nuggets to make you feel that it's um, worth listening to, uh, to me droning on again. So um, ground and air source heat pumps, the role of electrification, decarbonizing our homes, uh, all you ever want to know about high temperature heat pumps. Uh, John specifically asked me to, to update you all on the developments around high temperature devices uh, and implications for current government policy. Um, next one, please, John. I always think it's useful to set the scene. 
and uh, and I use various sort of mediums to try and show you why why we why we're doing this at all. So this little bit of video, if I can get it running in a second, yeah, there's the button. Um, this is a hundred years of impact of carbon emissions, uh, and what it does is it records the temperature, the average temperature increase across the planet. You'll be aware of the talk of 1.5 degrees. Um, so this will give you a feel for what's been happening for the last 120 years. I'm reason it won't play, Dean. What is it? Oh, that's a shame. That is a pity. Oh, well, you'll have to take my word for it. This is, really, this is actually a really nice visual of, um, uh, visual of, of um, uh, of what's been happening over the last 100 years. What you'll see is that up until about 1960, things weren't too bad. For the last 50 years, the acceleration in global temperatures has been quite scary. Um, so I'm sorry that won't run. So this is, a, this is another way of presenting um, uh, something um, uh, similar by way of background. You know, why is electrification carbon efficient? So why is it emissions efficient? Um, we're all aware of the carbon emissions from fossil fuels. What this does, this is a, a printout from a, a little app that sits on our own website. We call it Carbon Watch. What it does is it takes real time data from uh, National Grid uh, and presents the actual carbon emissions from different heating technologies at any given point in time. And you can actually search on this. If you go onto our website, you can search. You can do it regionally, you can look at the UK as a whole, you can look at uh, uh, England, you can look at Scotland, Cornwall, whatever it might be. So it's quite an interesting thing to play with. Um, and what, what, it's, what it's giving you, this is UK average. Uh, you can see that I pulled this screenshot uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon on the 1st of September. At the time, the grid was running. So if you look at the, the top gray box, the grid was running at 230 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Don't worry too much about the terminology. Um, it's the relative uh, number that's important. So what that is, that's the amount of CO2 that uh, is uh, emitted from the generator, the distribution, everything involved in getting that kilowatt hour of electricity to your house. And then the bar chart, displays the real-time carbon emissions from different primary fuels. <coughs> the bottom three bars uh, don't move because they are uh, element, you know, they're, they're functions of the science. So at the bottom, you've got coal, and you can see hugely carbon intensive. The next one up is oil, um, uh, which is you know, about half that of coal. Uh, the third one up, that is natural gas. Um, the one thing I didn't ask is whether any of you are actually off the gas grid or whether you've all got access to natural gas. But, so that's natural gas. The fourth bar up does actually move backwards and forwards because that is direct electric heating. So anybody who's got power wall heaters or some form of electric uh, heating, uh, maybe an immersion, uh, immersion in a hot water cylinder, that bar does move up and down with the grid. So as the grid is less carbon intensive, that bar becomes shorter. And as the grid becomes more carbon intensive, the, that bar gets longer. And the sorts of things that impact on the intensity of the grid are, is the wind blowing? Is the sun shining? Are our nuclear power stations online? Are we buying electricity from France, which is largely nuclear and therefore is also low carbon? Uh, and then the top two, this is our heat pumps. So very, very crudely, uh, an air source heat pump operating at uh, 3.2 to 1 and a ground source heat pump operating at 4 to 1. You can see that the carbon gain is enormous. 233, so this number, um, this number is about average for where we are at the moment. And in fact, 233, so just three grams different, is now the carbon factor recognized in building regulations. And that is actually shown by the small vertical black line. Um, so, so this shows you that we're already doing massive, making a massive impact on carbon emissions by electrifying our heat. Uh, next one, please. 
John. Um, I've seen a couple of questions popping up in the chat. Um, uh, I can answer them in real time if you wish. So, what's the significance of high temperature heat pumps? I've actually got a slide specifically on high, time, high temperature heat pumps. So, I think I, if it's okay, Richard, I'll wait and answer that one when we get to it. Um, the other one, advise what causes parasitic loads should be with high temperature heat pumps. With two installations, each one is a parasitic load of 120 watts. Even with a machine having no load, over uh, is using the one day doing nothing. Hmm. Okay, um, so uh, as with most electrical devices, even when they're in standby, they are using electricity. Um, uh, a pound a day sounds like uh, sounds like a lot. Um, but you will certainly be using something. Um, the sensors will all be running. Obviously, the the, uh, the brain in the controller will be running. Um, you might have circulation pumps, although 120 watts, that's probably low for a circulation pump. But there'll certainly be something. It's a bit like leaving your television on standby. Uh, there, are, there are always losses. Um, so this little spreadsheet, this presents not dissimilar information to the bar chart, but what I've done is just use this. So this does a comparison um, with various fuels in the same way. I've set this up for a sort of typical three bedroom, semi-detached um, uh, sort of estate build house from the eighties or nineties. Um, so energy demand is running at about 10,800 kilowatt hours a year. And why, why I've included this is because if you look at the last column on the right hand side, what it shows is I converted the emissions gain into vehicles taken off the road based on average family cars using data from DVLA and the RAC. And what you can see here is that even if you're on mains gas, uh, we are, and your, your air source heat pump is operating at 3.2 to 1 you are effectively almost displacing one vehicle off the road permanently. So 0.9 of a vehicle won't take much movement in the, in the carbon factor to get to a point where you've displaced the vehicle. If you're um, burning oil, so if you're off the gas grid and you're burning oil, it'd be one and a half cars. So that's just to put it into perspective of what it is we're achieving. Now, if we did all 26 million homes in the UK, it would be the same effect as taking 26 million cars off the road permanently. So, you know, it is, it's, it's significant, you know, so the difference that you can make on your own is significant. Uh, next one, please, John. So look, this is what we've now got from our new prime minister. So these are direct quotations made just before he went off to Egypt for the COP27. There is no long-term prosperity without action on climate change. There are no energy security. There is no energy security without investing in renewables. Climate and energy security go hand in hand. And then the two I like most: we can be we bequeath our children a greener planet and a more prosperous future. And and the last one: there really is room for hope. And actually, we have to know there's hope because if there's no hope, uh, we might as well all pack in. Now, what we need to do, of course, is to hold him to these statements and make sure that they start to deliver uh, some real action. Um, next one, please. Uh, I've left this in. Now we did, I think last time around, we did heat pumps 101. So yeah, how does a heat pump work? Um, if people either have this already or aren't interested, then I'm quite happy to move on. But if anybody wants to know how a heat pump works, I can give you a two minute tour very quickly. Anybody, anybody keen? You know, wave your hands or shout out, I don't mind. Yes, keen. Okay, excellent. Yeah, keen right. for two minutes, thanks. Okay, very quickly then. So, um, uh, this, as you can see, uh, shows uh, in a schematic form a ground source heat pump with a borehole. But the principles are exactly the same for all heat pumps. So, where you can see that borehole sitting there on the left-hand side, that could easily be uh, an air source unit with a fan, it could be a lake with water, it could be a river, it could be the sea, anything that's got a, an energy source fundamentally. Um, what's 
inside the gray uh, shape in the middle, that is effectively what's in the box. And a heat pump is uh, actually a very, very simple piece of uh, uh, mechanical kit. Um, and the beauty of this is that you've all got heat pumps already. Um, the gas compression cycle, so that's what underpins a heat pump, is ubiquitous. You've all got fridges, you've all got freezers, most of you have probably got air conditioning in your cars. Many of you might have a heat pump tumble dryer now, you've probably got a coffee machine. These are all heat pumps. So there's nothing scary. So the point of that is that this is not new technology which you should be afraid of. This is something that you've already got and are completely familiar with in your lives. We're just effectively turning the device around. So instead of generating cool to make your fridge cold, we're going to generate heat and make the home warm. So we inside the box, you can see there's a, a, a sealed circuit that goes from blue, round, through white, and back to red. That is a sealed, in a domestic unit, that's a sealed refrigerant circuit. It's hermetically sealed at factory, so no interference when, when the installers are putting them in, they don't touch that, they don't at all. And inside that circuit, we have a refrigerant. Uh, refrigerants come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors. We are increasingly moving to what we call natural refrigerants, which have very low global warming potential. So there is some changes coming in refrigerants, but fundamentally this refrigerant, so in the bottom corner on the left, it's blue uh, and it's in its liquid state. Uh, and that means that it's at very low temperature. So below about minus 15 degrees centigrade. Now you will remember from your schoolboy and schoolgirl physics, because I know you're all very attentive at school, that you can't compress a solid and you can't compress a liquid but you can compress a gas. And when you compress a gas, it gets very hot. And the evidence for that, again, cast your mind back to your school days when you were riding on your bicycle. If you were pumping up your tires and you put your finger over the end of the pump and you pump the uh, piston, it got hot. That's gas compression. So what happens is we bring in some form of source of energy, borehole, air, doesn't matter, which is at a higher temperature than minus 15 degrees. I mean, different refrigerants, we can, can go even lower, so we can operate at even lower temperatures. But we bring in that source into the first heat exchanger, which here is labeled as the evaporator. We transfer that energy into the refrigerant, which is sitting in the evaporator, and it boils it because, as I've said, you know, it boils at around about minus 15 degrees. So in the top left-hand side, We've now got gas, and we then put the gas into the compressor. And this is where the device uses most of its electricity. We compress the gas, and it gets very hot. And we can control the temperature that we're making. So on the top right-hand side, we've now got very hot gas. We put that into the second heat exchanger, called the condenser here, and we transfer that high temperature energy <coughs> into your radiators, underfloor heating, hot water cylinder, whatever it might be. Uh, and on the bottom right hand side, the refrigerant gas is now cooling. It's still a gas, but it's cooling because we've taken some of the energy out. And then at the bottom, you can see we have what's called an expansion valve. And what that does, it's a, it's a non, it's a one-way valve and it releases the pressure off the gas. And so the gas returns to its cold uh, liquid state. And all we're effectively doing is running that charge of refrigerant around that circuit while the heat pump's running. And when there's no call for heat, the, ch the circuit doesn't run. And as soon as the building calls for heat, the circuit runs. And it's exactly the same as happens in your fridge, your deep freeze, your car air conditioning. You know, so uh, it's a very, very simple piece of science. Beautiful piece of science, actually. I think it's poetry in motion. <laughs> But I would. I'm, I'm a bit odd like that. Uh, okay, so uh, next one, please, John. <clears throat> uh, what do they look like? Um, and I think there's probably one bit of a change here. So many of you may be familiar with the standard sort of external air source units, as you can see on the left hand side there. Uh, the unit in the, uh, and those are the smaller ones are about the size of a, what you might say was an air conditioning, an external air conditioning unit. The big one at the back higher capacity device 
whilst it's got two fans, it's actually a single circuit inside. So it's only one sort of heat pump circuit, but it has two fans so that um, when, when in the shoulder months of the year, spring water, you can just run on one fan. So it's a way of saving some energy. Unit in the top, uh, top middle, that's a ground source, domestic ground source unit. It's about the size of an under counter washing machine. Uh, the three at the bottom I've left in, they're interesting um, in that they have a format which is about the size of an upright fridge freezer. Two of them, as you can see, have got cylinders built in. So it's a way of keeping the footprint of your total plant um, down. The one on the left is a twin unit. You can see it's two heat pumps, and that is aimed at much larger, uh, larger properties. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got uh, the mighty red. So this is the new this is the new beast on the block, as it were. Uh, you can see it's a very different form factor, different shape. It's actually cylindrical. Uh, and this is a really nice unit because it's homegrown. It's British. Uh, it's actually designed and built in Northern Ireland. Uh, Red Renewable Energy Devices, the company is now owned by Octopus, and uh, they are going to drive that. Uh, they're going to drive that unit uh, and that company obviously pretty hard. So nice unit. It's particularly good for the UK because it is optimized for the UK climate. And UK climate is slightly different to the rest of Europe because uh, we don't get particularly cold temperatures in the winter, but we have very uh, high humidity. And <clears throat> humidity is a problem uh, that air source heat pumps have to overcome. They all do. This one happens to do it very well because it's specifically optimized for the UK climate. Next one, please, John. Uh, just to reassure you that you know you'll see a lot of chat on the web oh you must have underfloor heating you must have this you must have that absolutely not so a heat pump acts absolutely the same as a as a as a condensing boiler will operate with anything underfloor heating traditional um, sectional radiators uh, panel radiators trench heaters so bottom right hand side those are trench heaters and the unit in the middle is a fan coil, not something you'd see in your homes particularly, but if you go into a shop and you look up at the ceiling and you see some grills in the ceiling, what's behind them is a fan coil. Um, so any emitter type, the key, and the key actually for all heating systems, not just heat pumps, is that the emitter systems are designed properly. And here we've got, uh, we're, we're hitting something which, again, there'll be a bit, a bit of a note on the slides in the, you know, the coming up. Um, as I said, a condensing boiler, and most of you, I assume, have probably now got condensing boilers. I'd be surprised if there are any non-condensing boilers still left uh, out there in your part of the world. Um, condensing boilers are low temperature devices. They should be operating at 55 degrees flow temperature. Okay, 55 degrees doesn't sound very high. You know, you think that most boilers are probably running at 70. Um, and so you say, all oh, the radiators won't be very hot. They'll still be hot enough to discipline the children. You can still strap the kids to them as Tom Brown school days. Um, uh, and in terms of hot water, uh, it's a brave person that stands under a shower at more than about 42 degrees. So 55 degrees is actually <coughs> perfectly acceptable. Uh, next one, John. And again, just to reassure you, all property types. So blocks of flats, rows of terraced houses listed or not, new developments. Um, the picture in the middle is a school. Uh, the reason I've included that is that if we're doing a new development and we're building 2000 houses with a school and a health center and what have you, the commercial buildings, so the school health center, they will have a, probably have a high cooling requirement. And as with your fridge, the opposite of cooling is heat. If you put your hand around the back of your fridge, it's hot. And so the beauty of heat pump systems in this scenario is if we were doing a district heating scheme here, we could capture the waste heat from cooling the hospital or the school or whatever, and put it into a circuit to heat the houses it gives us some really, really good efficiencies. So lots of interesting things that we can play with when we're, we're looking at potential targets, um, <clears throat> particularly with new build. Um, uh, next one, please, John. 
uh, a little bit on the, the fear and doubt. So the incumbents, those who own the gas networks largely, uh, are, are busy putting out fear and doubt. So they'll tell you, oh, you've got to have underfloor heating or massive radiators. Absolutely not. Because the same design flow temperature applies to a properly configured condensing boiler <clears throat> as to a heat pump. 55 degrees, that's the magic number. Clearly, the lower the temperature, the better, but 55 degrees is the magic number. You've got to replumb the whole house and, and what have you. Absolutely not. Even microbore pipework, you know, in most instances, we can make heat pumps function perfectly well with microbore pipework. Uh, microbore, for those who know, it's very, very, it is what it says on the tin. It's very, very uh, narrow bore pipework, distribution pipework around the house which developers were using because, you guessed it, it's cheap. Uh, your garden's going to be a disaster. Yeah, okay, so ground source, you will make a mess, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> and if you drill, of course, the amount of mess is that much smaller because a borehole for a ground source heat pump is only 185 millimetres in diameter, about eight inches or so. Uh, and I would say we've been here before, <laughs> you know, End of the 60s, very, very few houses had central heating. And it was said at the time, oh, it's terribly expensive, it's terribly disruptive, no one will ever do it, only the wealthy can afford it. 30 years later, we've all retrofitted our houses with central heating, and somehow we all found the money. So I think we've been here before, uh, and uh, I don't see this as being a long-term barrier to progress. Uh, next one, please, John. So I've left this in um, because it's very important for any of you who are considering going down this route. It's very, very important that you get into bed with the right people. Uh, heat pumps do need a bit more emphasis on design than fossil fuel systems. And the reason for that is that the margin of error with fossil fuels is very wide. You can get a a uh, gas or oil system grotesquely wrong and yet in the main people are still warm and they still have hot water it may be hideously inefficient but the impact in terms of <coughs> services is is usually very modest with a heat pump system if you get the design badly wrong um it's probably going to be more expensive to run so less efficient just like the fossil fuel equivalent but actually you may find that the system just doesn't deliver so really important that you get into bed with the right people. You can read this in detail yourselves because um, John is going to circulate these slides in a PDF format, I believe, and you've got the recording anyway. But the key thing here is um, at the bottom, you can see we've got an element here, procurement advice. So on our website, we publish a document. It's a downloadable PDF document, and it, it doesn't teach you how to install a heat pump. What it does is it equips you with the questions that you need to pose to an installer, which will help you to identify whether you're talking to somebody who knows what they're doing or not. So I would strongly advise any of you who are thinking about going down the heat pump route, have a read of that document. It's quite long. We worried about whether it would scare people off, but in the end, we decided better to equip um, consumers such as you <clears throat> uh, to be able to uh, uh, buy with confidence. Uh, next one, please. Right, uh, okay, cool, typo. This should actually should say high temperature heat pumps. So apologies for that. So um, John specifically asked me to give you an update on high temperature heat pumps. And you can see here that the magic numbers of 70 and 55 jump out straight away. <clears throat> so high temperature heat pumps are coming through into the marketplace in greater numbers um, based on newer generation of refrigerant gases. So we've got new gases coming through, they're lower global warming potential, and they're allowing us to generate higher temperatures. Now, why is this good, given that we have established earlier that the lower the flow temperature, the more efficient the device? <clears throat> the thing with high temperature heat pumps is it does allow you to effectively replace a boiler that is running at 70 degrees or 65 degrees, in a light for light way with no changes to your emitter system, to your radiators on the floor, whatever. Now, if 
the property is surveyed properly for both heat losses and for the power of the existing radiators. Uh, in most instances, in my experience, you'll find that you can even run your boiler at a lower temperature than you probably do now, uh, potentially even down to the magic number of 55 degrees. But what an HT, what a high temperature unit does, is that it gives you confidence that if you needed higher temperatures in the middle of winter, when it was minus three or minus four outside, you could get them out of the device. Now, if the heat pump doesn't need to make high temperature water, it won't. It'll only make the temperature required and the sensors in the system determine what that is. And if it's running at lower temperature, there's no negative, there's no downside, it just means that the efficiency is better. So high temperature heat pumps uh, absolutely have their place in, in terms of providing that confidence level. Uh, um, but I think that ultimately we should get to a point where everybody can operate their systems at 55 degrees or less. Uh, and that means that high temperature devices won't be needed. Doesn't mean we won't still make them, but you wouldn't actually need them. Uh, the other element to consider here is that you may have heard talk of what we call um, hybrid heat pump deployment. So in a hybrid scenario, <clears throat> one has a heat pump, but you've retained a fossil fuel boiler. And these two can be put together in various configurations, but fundamentally, the Committee on Climate Change would consider a hybrid to be appropriate where 80% of the energy comes from the low carbon source, the heat pump, and only 20% comes from the fossil fuel system. And potentially, the concept here is that when it gets very low, very cold outside, the heat pump can't cope on its own, you switch to the fossil fuel boiler for a small number of hours a year when the air temperature is below zero. So if you've got a high temperature unit, of course, you don't need to take that approach. So it is a way of combating any talk of hybridization because all hybrids do is perpetuate the burning of fossil fuels. Okay, that's the, the only argument in favor of is that they allow gas and oil companies to continue to pump gas and oil. Uh, there is no other benefit now that we've got systems that can deliver uh, high temperatures. Um, government actually considered penalizing high temperature technology in the various support schemes. And we managed to persuade them not to, because as I said, they only generate high temperatures when they need to, <clears throat> when the air temperature is very low. The impact on efficiency in the year is actually very modest because they're only slightly less efficient when they're at high temperature and that only is for what, 30, 40 hours a year, something like that. Um, and if they're weather compensated, so they are fluctuating the temperature that they're generating, depending on how warm or cold it is outside, the impact on efficiency is incredibly small. You couldn't measure it. And there are many other factors that will influence the efficiency rather more. Um, <clears throat> The only possible exception to allowing the system to vary the flow temperature and therefore keep its efficiency at optimal level all the time is if we are using a time of use tariff. Now, most of you are familiar with the concept of charging an electric vehicle overnight on low cost electricity. We can actually run a heat pump overnight on low cost electricity uh, and get the same, the same benefit. There, of course, you don't know what flow temperature you're going to need the following day. So you have to store that energy. So you run the heat pump overnight, you store the energy in a cylinder locally in your home, and you bleed it into the house during the day. Uh, it does mean you're operating at very low cost, but it needs, it needs a bit of design. Uh, next one, please, John. There's a little bit here on location and planning. And again, I think you can read these ones in detail. I'm acutely aware of, of, of time here. Um, essentially, permitted development rights applies in pretty well all domestic heat pump deployment. Um, there are issues, uh, there are there are requirements around noise that need to be met. That's the MCS 020 uh, test. Um, uh, clearly, conservation areas, listed buildings. There may be some uh, some some requirements. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as I said, we've got some new form factors coming through and you'll see some, some images uh, coming through shortly. Um, so effectively, uh, 
permitted development rights for pretty well all domestic uh, uh, deployment. Um, uh, how do you decide whether high temperature heat pump is required rather than going direct to low temperature other than full analysis? Uh, the answer is you have to do the analysis. So you, you, you can assume that you need a high temperature and put it in because, as I said, there's no real downside. But um, uh, actually, there is no substitute for doing the analysis. And the microgeneration certification scheme, MCS, standard requires the installer to do the analysis. So, <clears throat> uh, and in fact, I would argue that the same analysis should be done even when you install a fossil fuel boiler, uh, because you, you need the same information unless you're gonna start guessing at it. While the fossil fuel industry has been guessing at uh, uh, that information since uh, the late 60s. Uh, and as a result, the average heat load in UK homes is about 10 kilowatts peak heat load. The biggest selling condensing boiler in the UK is a 32 kilowatt condensing boiler. So most of the boilers being sold are grotesquely oversized because they're just guessing. They're not bothering to do the analysis. So the answer to, uh, the answer to your, uh, your question, Dave, is um, you have to do the analysis. Uh, uh, related to Dave's question, how does the cost of HT compare to LT? Okay, so at the moment, <clears throat> high temperature units are a little bit more expensive. Um, compared to the cost of the system as a whole, uh, I don't think it would be a barrier to you, anybody investing in a high temperature unit. Um, but part of the cost is not so much the high temperature function, it's the fact that we're moving to lower global warming potential refrigerants. And of course, because they've got these improved properties, they tend to be more expensive. But as we move the whole industry across to them, the economies of scale will kick in. So ultimately, I don't think there'll be any difference at all between the cost, the capital cost of high temperature and low temperature. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please, John. So here's just a few pictures you look at. So anybody who does have an oil-fired boiler, um, what would you rather have outside your, your house? You know, a, a green oil tank or one of these heat pumps? Um, so you can see we've got two color-coded units in the, in the middle there. Uh, and on the right hand side, there's the mighty red from Northern Ireland uh, in green livery um, and in a rural environment, it looks a bit like a composter. And so it doesn't actually look out of place at all. Um, so you put it in a rural garden looking like that, uh, really nice machine. So industry is doing what it can to make the visuals that much more attractive. Uh, next one, please, John. A uh, couple of quick case studies just to sort of give you some feel for the types of uh, savings that can be achieved. Now, we haven't yet found a dwelling that we can't put a heat pump into. There isn't, a, there's no such thing in my view. And in fact, government ran something called the Heat Pump Demonstrator Program last year. They installed nearly 750 heat pumps. They analyzed about 5,000 buildings, I think, to try and find one that they could, well, to, to, to see if there are any they couldn't put a heat pump in. They couldn't find any. Um, so this is a, a barn conversion, um, barn conversion and relocation actually, taken down, moved, rebuilt. <clears throat> so it's still a pretty leaky building. It's quite big. So it has a heat demand that's five or six times average. Uh, this is running on a pair of Nordic, they happen to be Swedish heat pumps, air source heat pumps. Um, eight tons of CO2 saved per year. And it's the equivalent of taking nearly five cars off the road permanently. So really good carbon benefits, uh, no problem at all with the heating of what is a still a relatively leaky, relatively large house. Uh, next one, please, John. A uh, little bit on building regulations. So, uh, and again, we're back to the magic 55 degrees. So <clears throat> in 2005, we introduced a mandate that all new boilers should be condensing boilers. Uh, and the, 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 the theory is that a, a condensing boiler is significantly more efficient than uh, a non-condensing boiler. That is true, but it's only more efficient when it's in condensing, operates in condensing mode. And it will only do that if the temperature that comes back to the boiler, having been round the circuit in your house, is less than 56 degrees. <clears throat> That's a factor of science, because uh, it's the dew point 
uh, you're hitting the dew point. Um, the only way to guarantee it's 55, 56 degrees or less is to put it in at 55 degrees. Now, government in 2005, as I say, mandated condensing boilers, but failed to mandate that they were installed and commissioned such that they ran in condensing mode. Most boilers leave the factory preset at 65 or 70 degrees. Uh, as a result, at the moment, in the UK boiler fleet, almost all of them are failing to operate in condensing mode. In fact, somebody put a tweet up about 18 months ago and claimed that at any given time, only 1% of fossil fuel boilers in the UK were condensing. What was noticeable about that tweet was not that it was a shocking number, which it is, but that the boiler industry did not fight that at all. They stayed completely silent, which suggests to me that they didn't have the data to prove it wasn't right. In June this year, building regulations at last caught up. There is now a requirement in building regulations to design systems for a flow temperature of 55 degrees, regardless of what technology you've got. Doesn't matter whether it's oil, gas, LPG, heat pumps, biomass, it all has to be 55 degrees. So that at last puts us on a, on a level playing field and ensures that everybody gets the benefit of a condensing boiler. It's not retrospective yet. So if you are changing your boiler and you're not going down the heat pump route, <clears throat> that's, you know, if you're on natural gas, that's perfectly understandable at this stage. It's really important that that new boiler goes in size 55 degrees and that your uh, radiators are evaluated properly using the appropriate uh, 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 methodologies <coughs> to ensure that you can run your house on 55 degrees. And I must tell you, it's perfectly possible. There is absolutely no reason why you can't run your house at 55 degrees or less. In 2024-25, we will get something called the Future Home Standard, all being well, should be an announcement in December on this. This will apply to new build, but it will um, mandate effectively against fossil fuels and new build for the first time. We're frequently asked whether putting in a heat pump will improve your EPC. At the moment, that's your energy performance certificate. At the moment, the answer is no, because the methodology used to create the energy performance certificate does not recognize the carbon benefit of a heat pump. It's a travesty, and it doesn't help us with our aim to get to the UK to net zero 2050, and it will change, but at the moment, there isn't an EPC in the country which will recommend a heat pump. Uh, <clears throat> has that interim uplift to building regulations from June changed this? No, it hasn't. We've got to wait till 2025 for that change. And additionally, there is no recognition at the moment in building regulations or any of the standards for the value of the thermal storage and the use of time of use tariffs for heat pumps. And that is critical because that is going to significantly reduce the amount of money that UK PLC has to spend on wind turbines, solar farms, nuclear, and critically, the cables in the ground. Next one, please. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try and you know, rattle through these last few because then I do want to try and get to your questions in a meaningful way. So there are two aspects to affordability. <clears throat> One is operational cost. Uh, and the reason I put this slide up is that the, the image on the left, as you can see, is the makeup of a typical gas bill. And on the right, electricity. This is off -gen. These are off-gen pie charts. Um, the social... Uh, the environmental and social obligation costs, so that's a levy, up until the off-gen price cap was announced eight weeks ago, the tax, this affects the tax, as you can see, gas, fossil fuel, only 1.86%. Electricity, increasingly low carbon, a whopping 22.92%. So we have a tax regime that encourages the burning of fossil fuels. Clearly that's got to change. And, and you, know, you don't have to be a, uh, an accountant to work out that if those levies came off, even if they came off both fuels, 
the impact on electricity cost and therefore on the cost of running a heat pump would be massive. Next one, please. Clearly, capital cost is then the problem. Um, and in fact, I think capital cost is less of a problem. And I'll explain why, why that's the case. If you look at uh, the automotive industry, uh, electric vehicles, until the recent chaos in the market, but electric vehicles were incredibly cheap to run because you could charge them overnight. You know. As a result, people wanted them, so the demand was huge. And the finance sector found ways of getting the capital to those that wanted an electric vehicle. If heat pumps become the lowest cost fuel uh, uh, heat system by a margin, clearly demand will be there. And actually, I think that the finance industry will find ways of getting the money through. But in the meantime, we have something called the boiler upgrade scheme. The last time I spoke to your audience, we had the renewable heat incentive. Uh, the renewable heat incentive closed at the end of March. The replacement is the boiler upgrade scheme, which is a capital grant. So it gives you, <clears throat> uh, if you put in an air source heat pump, it gives you £5,000 grant, if, uh, regardless of the size of the heat pump. Uh, if you put in ground or water source, it's, uh, it's £6,000, but actually that isn't enough to, to compensate for the additional capital cost. And so the market for ground or water source at the moment is very constrained, seriously constrained. But pretty good value for most people for uh, an air source device. If your home is sort of average and needs about 10 kilowatts, um, that £5,000 is going to be around about 40% of the cost. So it's a considerable, um, a considerable benefit. It only applies to all dwellings and small commercial properties up to a peak demand of 45 kilowatts. As I said, average house, 10 kilowatts. So 45 kilowatts is quite a big property. Um, there are limits on the scheme, which may throttle the market, but we're nowhere near the limits at the moment. So there are plenty of uh, there are plenty of vouchers to be had. It works on a voucher scheme. Um, about 850 MCS certified installers, those are installers that are certified under the microgeneration certification scheme, are registered to deliver the boiler upgrade scheme. So <clears throat> there shouldn't be any shortage of installers. Um, you just got to make sure, as I said earlier, you find the really find the really good ones. Um, as of the end of October, there have been about nine thousand applications for these vouchers uh, since the start of April, um, uh, and there are uh, thirty thousand vouchers available this year up until the end of March. So plenty of time. Um, they could be really valuable for off gas. Uh, because of the, the vagaries of the oil and LPG market. Um, but the one thing I would point out, and this is, I think, important, that all subsidy and grant schemes come with a cliff edge. So they come with a closure point. And that closure point does stop people investing because installers won't recruit and train new people if they think a scheme is coming to an end. And so yeah, there is a concern about subsidies and grants whilst they're great for those that get them um, they can actually be a bit of a barrier to to the market uh, and then the last thing is that as of the budget in april this year um, domestic heat pump systems attract a zero rate vat uh, there are one or two anomalies in that but fundamentally if you have a uh, an air or ground source heat pump system put in by a single contractor um, the zero the vat rate is zero uh, that reduced from 5%, which is what the uh, discounted rate was. And that's actually, um, dare I say, a Brexit benefit because being out of the European Union allows us to vary our VAT rates in a way that we couldn't before. Uh, next one, please, John. So um, government uh, has this term, able to pay. <clears throat> so you're either in fuel poverty or you're considered the able to pay. Um, uh, everyone likes a handout. You know, we all love the idea that no one's going to give us some money. But fundamentally, all they're doing is giving you your own money back, because I'm assuming most of you are taxpayers. Um, now, <clears throat> there are, there's evidence that there's little consumer resistance to long-term loans. Scotland has a loan scheme 
Yes, it's interest free, so it's very attractive, but their deployment rate has nearly trebled with a loan scheme rather than grants. So there's plenty of evidence to say that loans are fine. What it does, of course, is it means there are no cliff edge because the loans are just rolling. Now, there's no throttle on the investment that the industry will make in skills and capacity, which is, of course, vital to building the market. Um, putting a heat pump into your home, it's a private investment, but in part, it's a public good because there are societal benefits for decarbonisation and, and what have you. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so it's actually perfectly reasonable that government makes some form of affordability scheme available because it's a social good. So in these discussions, and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say afterwards, you know, able to pay, I think, is actually can be offensive in some instances because you might be able to pay, but that doesn't mean you've necessarily got the cash sitting down the back of the sofa. So I have identified this new co cohort who I'm calling willing to contribute. I'm meeting lots of consumers out there who are willing to contribute. They want to do the right thing. Many of them are thinking about their children, their grandchildren, but they want to do the right thing, but they need an affordability package that allows them to do it. And that's one of the tasks that industry faces with government at the moment. We are going to construct uh, an affordability package. Next one, please. So, uh, hopefully, most of you would have come across this concept of 600,000 heat pumps a year. It was one of Boris's big numbers. <clears throat> so, he had a target of 600,000 heat pump, domestic heat pump deployments per annum by 2028. Can we still get there, given that this year we'll probably do about 75,000? So we've got to effectively double, nearly double the size of the industry year on year, pretty well, to get to 2028 and 600,000. So what do we need to get there? We need consumer confidence. People like you need to be able to invest in heat pumps with confidence. And I think that comes from consistency of government message and a really robust consumer protection scheme. We have got to make sure that we can look after consumers in the event that something doesn't go well. And you know, we're like any other industry. We try really hard to be perfect all the time, but you know, clearly things go wrong. So I think it's really important that we have a robust consumer protection scheme, which we are improving all the time. And we're back to my affordability package. So we need consistency of message, we need consumer protection that's bulletproof, and we need an affordability package. We also need the legislation, so future home standard, that is the, <clears throat> that is the standard that will mean effectively no new boilers in new build houses from 2025. Uh, and we need legislation for off gas. Now the government is currently consulting on what to do about homes that are off the gas grid, which are largely burning boiler LPG, both of which are more carbon intensive than gas. <clears throat> We are waiting for them to, that those consultations closed comments back in January, and we're waiting for government to bring forward their response and tell us whether they're gonna enact what was consulted on. If they do, from 2026, which is not very far away, it will not be possible to replace a failed boiler LPG boiler off the gas grid. So if you're off the gas grid from 2026, not sure whether it's January the 1st or December the 31st yet, you would not be able to replace the boiler. Now, if we had that in place already, we knew that was coming, we could be using the boiler upgrade scheme to help people to displace uh, you know, their fossil fuels. So these things all tie in together. Um, <clears throat> we may need some proportional grant contribution for early adopters off the gas grid because you know, clearly they are gonna be early adopters. We haven't yet got the economies of scale from a much, much bigger industry. As I said, in Scottish, in the Scottish experience, zero rate loans, deployment up by 50% well, year on year it is. So it's really significant. Uh, next one, please, John. I think we're getting close to the end now. Clearly, tenants, homeowners are absolutely key. We have to bring the public with us. If we're going to make this work, we have to bring the public along because you know, what we, what we can't have is resistance to decarbonisation because that would be a disaster. So on the, um, <clears throat> on the red side, well, fossil fuels just work. 
uh, Jeremy Vine said so on his radio show, so he must be right. Um, uh, actually, do they? We've already established that most boilers are not condensing. And the difference in efficiency, 94% if the boiler is operating in condensing mode, less than 80% if it's not. So if all our boilers were operating in condensing mode, we wouldn't be buying any Russian gas now. We wouldn't need to because we'd be using you know 10 to 12 percent less gas anyway so that's a that, that's a question you know do fossil fuels work <clears throat> we're all of us resistant to change and we're you know potentially afraid of change but i think we can get over that <coughs> we have a low valuation of energy this is this is this is um, represented by our incredible wasteful nature with energy up until very recently and what's happened with the price of gas lately you know, getting people to insulate their homes properly, getting them to insulate their loft space even, when we were giving the materials away for free 20 years ago, almost impossible because gas was so cheap, no one cared. So we need to change our, our view and our valuation we place on energy. And of course, what's happened tragically in Ukraine and, and uh, driven the price is making people think again about insulation and draft proofing and you know, all those good things. But there's the capital cost issue we've talked about, the operational cost, what we refer to as the spark gap, and that's the price of electricity versus price of gas. We've discussed that already. And there's knowledge and understanding and the fact that you have taken your time out to uh, to inform yourselves by coming to a talk like this is tremendous because you are building your knowledge and understanding. On the positive side, we've got environmental attitudes are shifting. You know, David Attenborough, um, biggest rock star at Glastonbury a couple of years ago. Fantastic. Greta, you may you know, like or loathe her, she has changed attitude, no doubt about it. And what we're seeing from that is intergenerational pressure. So, you know, school children are going home and questioning their parents, you know, why are we still burning oil? Um, why aren't we moving <clears> on? <throat> we've got regulation coming. So building regulations we've talked about, off gas consultations we've talked about. Uh, Mies is something that applies to the landlord. So if any of you have got rental properties, Mies is minimum energy efficiency standards. And it's a, uh, it's a minimum standard that rental properties will have to meet. Uh, we've got some government subsidies at the moment. Again, we've discussed that. And we've got a better offer. We've got controllability. We've got all those good things. Yeah, there's a transitional approach around hybrids. But actually, I think the, the high temperature breed of heat pumps will knock that on the head pretty quickly. Uh, next one, please, John. So what do we need from government? Well, there's a list here of stuff we need from government, most of which we've already talked about. Again, I think you can read this in your, uh, in, uh, in your own time. Um, next one, please. I've included this because this is a critical part of paying for this. Uh, this is a complex looking graph, so don't worry about the graph, don't worry about the image. The key here is for you to get your heads around this concept of load shifting. So charging your electric vehicle overnight, you've shifted the load from a peak period when electricity is in demand to a period when we've got spare excess electricity coming off wind turbines in the North Sea. I talked to you about doing the same thing with a heat pump and charging a thermal store. <clears throat> and I see there's some questions in the chat about that to get into. Being able to move those loads around so that we don't get these massive peaks in electricity demand has a colossal value. Imperial College put a number on it uh, two or three years ago. They reckon it's worth 16.7 billion pounds per annum by 2050. You know, we can build a number of uh, hospitals and schools for 16.7 billion pounds. And that saving comes from not having to build more wind turbines than we need and not having to put more cables in the ground than we need because we are spreading out over a full 24 hours the time that we are drawing down electricity. So that's really, really important. We, we, we call it flexibility. Government has recognized flexibility in electric vehicle charging for a long time. They are now realizing that flexibility from heat is also enormous. Okay, so really, really important we grasp that as a nation because that really is a strong part of how we're going to pay for all this. Uh, next one, please. 
and I think we are pretty well there. So look, uh, uh, I'm um, I'm in Wiltshire, <laughs> so this is clearly one of my favourite shots. Uh, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones, and the Oil Age, oil and gas age, will not end because we ran out of oil. Um, that was frequently attributed to Sheikh Imani, who was Saudi oil minister in the 70s and 80s. Um, actually, I think it really came from Don Hubert, but, uh, who worked for Shell. But the important thing about this is um, our forebears recognised that all their energy came from the sun. And actually, all our energy should and can come from the sun. And it doesn't matter whether it's solar PV, solar thermal, wind, tidal, biomass, heat pumps, it's all driven by energy from the sun. And looking at global energy demand, we've only got to capture something in the region of one and a half to 2% of the energy that the sun gives us. And we don't need anything else at all. If it was 50%, you'd say, oh, that's difficult. But one and a half to 2%, we can do that, which means we can then leave the fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, ping the last one, that'll have my contact details, but you'll be able to pick that all up from the slides when they're circulated. And um, there we go. It was a whip through, and I'm sorry it all got a bit rushed at the end, but I'm conscious of your evenings. Um, and I'd like to get to the questions in the uh, in the chat, if that's all right with everybody. Certainly. Do you want me to go through them, Bean? Well, I've got, I've got the chat up, actually, so uh, I'm going to go back to... Yeah where I think we got to uh, the cost of the relative cost of high temperature and low temperature. Uh, and I'm then looking at the question from Anne, uh, who says, uh, can we incorporate solar thermal panel with air source for hot water? Yes, you can. Absolutely, you can. Um, you will need a specific type of cylinder that has two coils in it. I mean, presumably you've already got uh, a solar thermal cylinder with two coils. <coughs> What you need to do is have that cylinder evaluated to see if it was also heat pump compatible. Um, but either way, the, if you're already incorporating your solar thermal with your boiler, you would be able to do exactly the same with uh, with a heat with an air source heat pump. Jolly good, good to know. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Uh, in addition to the kit outdoors, is much space required in the house? So this one is a um, this is almost a sort of uh, optional question. So you'll need a hot water cylinder. If you've got a combi boiler at the moment, you will not have a hot water cylinder. And of course, this is one of the things that developers, one of the reasons why developers love them so much, because they don't have to buy a cylinder. And more importantly, they don't have to find space. And of course, houses are getting smaller and smaller, new build houses, are just tending to get smaller. So yes, we are going to have to find some space. We're going to find space for a hot water cylinder. I've also taught you about flexibility and to do to deliver flexibility, you need another cylinder, a thermal store. That's more space. However, what we have now got are technologies which use um, uh, which use something which is completely gone from my mind. Don't get old because your mind goes to mush. Uh, <laughs> phase change materials. <laughs> uh, um, the leading exponent in the UK is a company called SunAmp. Uh, and what they can do is they can store energy, thermal energy, in a phase change material. And what that's making use of is the energy released when you go from solid to liquid and liquid to gas. So you can store the same amount of energy in a volume which is about 25% of the equivalent volume of water. So if you had a thousand litre cylinder of water, a metric ton of water, you would be able to store the same amount of energy in a 250 litre phase change unit. That means your storage devices can get much smaller. They are more expensive at the moment, but again, as the market builds. So yes, space is needed. And the way to think about this, the way I try to get people to think about this is, when we were burning fossil fuels, you're burning a fuel which has been compressed over millions of years. It's got very small. And similarly, what we've done is we've compressed the size of the kit. So we've made boilers smaller and smaller and smaller, ideally so we can wall hang them. They're made out of thinner and thinner sheet materials, so they're lighter weight. They can be hung on the wall. 
So everything's got smaller in fossil fuel world. In our world, and this applies to all renewables, biomass and whatever, you're burning fuel which is uncompressed. And so similarly, the kit is uncompressed. So everything in our world is physically big. And fundamentally, the bigger it is, the better it is, very crudely. You know, if you're doing ground source, the more pipe in the ground, the more efficient the system will be. If you're doing air source, the bigger the evaporator, the fan effectively, the more efficient the system will be. So <clears throat> uh, we will have to think about space. But to give you an example of where we're being a bit creative, uh, we were looking at doing a whole village down on the south coast, <clears throat> mainly estate houses, cottages, um, that had all had their outside loos, obviously dispensed with and new bathrooms put in the, in the cottages years ago. What we did is we went to the footprint of the old outside loo attached to the outside of the building and said, there you go, great. Rebuild that, put the cylinder in it. So, you know, there are creative things you can do about finding space. And what we will also see is new form factor, so shapes. So instead of a traditional cylinder shape, which is obviously quite wasteful in space, I think we're going to see a lot of new form factors. So uh, we'll call them cylinders, but water storage, which is a different shape that means it takes up less space in the house. Um, they might be horizontal, so they sit up in the attic space easier. There's a whole range of uh, options. <clears throat> but fundamentally, yes, we'll need more space. Bing, what coefficient of forward? Yeah. Bing, can I interrupt just for a second? Sure. We're now something like an hour and a quarter. If you can hopefully get through the last few questions as quick as you can. I will. I'll Thank try and you. dance through. I'll try and dance through. Talk. So I'm now down to Andrew Hailston. What coefficient of performance, COP, can be expected from various types of heat pump, ground source, air source, high temperature? Does this vary with outside temperature and with flow temperature required? Uh, yes, it does vary. <clears throat> so COP, coefficient performance, is an instantaneous measure. In terms of evaluating the system, we're more interested in what we call seasonal performance factor. SPF, so that's the average performance over the year. If you compare like for like quality, ground source in the UK is fundamentally more efficient because the ground temperature is higher than the air temperature in the winter when you're generating most of the heat. So ground source fundamentally, again, like for like quality, 25% more efficient, 20 to 25% more efficient. But it's twice the price. So if you're going to be in the house for a long term, you know, if, it's the, if it's the forever house for 40 years and you can afford the capital of the ground source, it will repay you in spades. Um, clearly, it's one of those things where you have to take your, uh, you know, you take your choice. And for most people, they will look at air source. We are creative again with ground source with what we call shared ground loops you can get together with neighbors you can share some of the capital cost there are creative things coming to market but fundamentally ground source more efficient but more expensive <clears throat> ht units slightly more expensive the efficiency does vary of course so the efficiency is partly driven by the difference between the flow temperature we're asking the device to make and the source temperature. So that delta T, that's the difference between the two temperatures. So clearly when it's air temperature very low and we're making a high temperature for radiating on the floor, efficiency will be down. But in spring and autumn, when the air temperature might be 12 degrees, 14 degrees, uh, and you can heat the house with only 35 degrees in the radiators, efficiency will be very high. The, the beauty of ground source is the temperature in the ground is con fairly consistent all year round. Um, <clears throat> uh, where air source does start to win out, anyone who, is, uh, who happens to have a, an outdoor swimming pool, if your air source machine is doing the pool in the summer and the house in the winter, in the summer when the air temperature is 16, 20 degrees, that machine is very efficient. So you might get really good efficiency in the summer, you sacrifice a bit in the winter, the average performance over the year is, is acceptable. Um, would you ever recommend ground source rather than air source, given that the additional efficiency saving does not cover the capital cost? So, yeah, we are back to longevity here. 
So if you are taking the long-term view, you know, if you're in your house for 40 years, uh, actually you will get the capital back. It depends on what the cost of capital is and how you evaluate the cost of capital. Um, why should government apply a higher subsidy to the ground source? Okay, so there is an argument that says, why reward people if they've got the capital to do ground source themselves, you know, don't give them a subsidy. But there is a social benefit to ground source because ground source machines <clears throat> tend to, to deliver the same power output, take less power input. And that means less generators in the North Sea or in the fields or in the nuclear power stations and less cabling in the ground. So there's a social benefit to ground source. So that is the justification for government providing a higher subsidy for ground source. Um, uh, whether you can justify it on socioeconomic grounds is another question, far above my pay grade. Uh, uh, Richard Andrews, uh, oh, that's a carry on, is it? Uh, no, that's new. rather than running a heat pump overnight to take advantage of off-peak electricity and storing the heat, would storing off-peak or home-generated solar power, electricity in a battery be equally efficient? Um, it's, a diff it's another approach. Uh, to be honest, I've not done the work to work out the efficiency. So I can't tell you what would be more efficient, but it's another approach. And what I would say to you is that by the time we've all of us started moving to electrified heat and electrified vehicles, we are likely to see a combination of both. So you'll have vehicle to grid, so you'll store electricity in your car battery. Whether you sell that back to the grid or whether you put it in your heat pump doesn't actually matter. So I think ultimately we're going to see a combination of different types of local storage. The key is it's local storage, whether it's batteries because you've self-generated <clears throat> or indeed whether you charge your battery on low cost electricity from the grid, of course. Um, but one way or another, it's local storage and that's the key. I'm afraid I can't tell you whether one mechanism will be more efficient than the other. What I would say is that intuitively, if you're only using one mechanism, it's probably going to be more efficient than two mechanisms. So storing electricity to drive the heat pump, mm, don't know. Storing the heat straight off, probably slightly more energy efficient, even if not cost efficient. So, um, but, but yeah, that needs a bit of thought. Um, do you have any views on when electricity market reform will lower power price and further close the spark spread? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I can't tell you when because, of course, it's government. But what I can tell you is that there is a, another government consultation running at the moment, uh, REME, -E -E, which is looking specifically at the mechanisms that we currently use to set the price of electricity, which is currently tied to the price of gas. So the only reason that the price of electricity has climbed so much in recent times is because we've tied it to the price of gas. You know, about 50% of our electricity now comes off wind and solar and, uh, and another 20% from nuclear. The generating costs in those industries hasn't changed. But the price of electricity has soared because it's driven by the wholesale price of gas. And not only that, it's driven by the last on gas generator, which of course is always the most expensive. So yes, I do expect that to come down. Time frame, not sure. Committee on Climate Change have long said that by 2030, the real price of electricity will be falling. And of course, for those people who are putting some solar PV on the roof and therefore reducing their average electricity price anyway, um, they're already taking steps to make that change themselves. So we are absolutely going to see this. So time of use tariffs, local generation, moving away from the mechanism that ties price of electricity to price of gas, you can see the price of electricity is absolutely going to come down. Um, does citing, and this is the last one, I think, um, John, so far, does citing the heat pump in sun or shade make much difference? No, it doesn't. Um, uh, if, you, if you cite it in somewhere that you know is a frost pocket, then clearly that's less good. But the key about location of an air source unit is actually to make sure the airflow is really good. You need good, clean energy uh, airflow going into the back of the machine. 
and you need to make sure that the cold exhaust, which in most instances comes out the front, one or two send it vertical, but most of them, they come out the front. You need to make sure that there's lots of room in front for that cold air to disperse. Because if it hits a wall or a shed and bounces back and the heat pump starts to suck its own cold exhaust, you can get into a vicious circle. So really important to make sure you've got really clean airflow being in sun or shade, little difference, because in the winter when you need it most, the sun isn't going to be that strong. Um, and uh, shade is not really going to make a difference, provided you're avoiding, say, anywhere you know where it just sits. If you've got a, a sort of um, a blind alley in your garden where you know the cold air just sits because it's not being dispersed by wind, that's clearly not a good place. Um, I did see somebody who put an aerosol heat pump sandwich between two sheds. There was a gap between two sheds and they put the heat pump in there and wondered why it didn't work very well because it was just doing this and it was just getting colder and colder and colder. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's the questions there. Um, John, I don't know whether you all had enough or whether anybody's got anything they want to liven their microphones up and, and shout out and talk and challenge. Oh, can, I, can I just interject for a moment? Um, we can take uh, a few questions from the floor in a minute, but can I first of all do a bit of publicity for MEG? Um, we do have these talks as often as we can. We're trying to get one by Ripple, who people may have heard of. So that's the hopefully the next one we're going to do, but hasn't been arranged yet. Uh, but we're all also interested in hearing from members with regard to any topic they think we should be covering. So please let us know if you've got nothing we should be getting a talk on. Um, our next event, as far as we're concerned, is our Christmas social on the 15th of um, December on Thursday, 7.30 in the garden room of Liston Hall, where we will have a quiz, general knowledge I hasten to add, mold wine, soft drinks, and hopefully a thermal camera demonstration as well. Um, so I'm gonna cut that out of the YouTube video that we make and now go back to the floor to see if anybody's got any questions they want to make now. So over to everybody. You're all stunned in silence. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, did, just a rather cheeky one. Is there any significance in the, in the fact you're wearing a thick jumper jacket and uh, mitts on your hands? <laughs> uh, yeah, there is actually. Um, so look, one of the slides that I used to use when I did presenting to school children talked about insulation. And of course, the starting point is dressing for the season. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Very and my children, I don't know, I mean, my children are all in their 20, well, 30s and 20s now, but yeah, historically, they would run around in their shorts and T-shirts in the winter and complain, <laughs> why isn't the heating on? And in the summer, when we were going out anywhere, they'd come out the door in jeans. And we'd say, no, go and put some shorts on. So I dress for the winter, and actually I quite like dressing for the winter. Uh, yeah. My office is in a converted barn. Well, I'm in <laughs> two loose boxes. Um... Actually, it has resistive electric heat because I'm renting this house. It's not my choice. Um, and the temperature in here at the moment is 11.9 degrees, which means that I keep my body warm with insulation. My brain is in cool space. And what's left of it, now I'm so old, um, functions reasonably well, I hope. I, beg you. I have a quick question. Um, which is a bit of a dodgy question to ask, actually. We had a quotation from British Gas who came here and said they could only fit a normal heat pump, they couldn't fit a high temperature one, full stop, but they would have to replace every of our eight radiators, full stop. And then they gave us a relatively high quotation. From what you're saying, are they right in saying what they're saying? Okay, so <clears throat> um, what, what people like British Gas and CB Heat and Octopus are doing is 
in their way, they're transforming the market. But they're, what they're doing, they're, they're trying to drive, they're trying to drive everything towards a, a narrower set of relatively clearly defined systems. So their own procurement processes can be really, really efficient. And so what they're doing initially is they're targeting what we would call relatively standard houses. So Octopus, for example, I saw a note from someone, uh, an email earlier on today saying someone had had Octopus come around and they said, no, we can't do your house, it can't be done because you've got microfoil pipe work. Actually, I've got to challenge Octopus because they're members of ours and I've got to say, look, you mustn't say that because it's not true. Op uh, microboard doesn't stop you having heat pump, but I completely understand that Octopus don't want the technical challenge of dealing with microboard. They haven't got the time. They're trying to drive the price down. So British Gas, um, and obviously can't come out on the pricing, John, because I haven't seen the numbers, but in, in a similar fashion, if they're saying, actually, we don't currently provide HT heat pumps because we're not buying them anywhere, uh, therefore, we can only give you a standard temperature heat pump. And on that basis, we think we've got to change all the radiators. You can see that thought process. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to do that. Because if they haven't surveyed, have they formally surveyed the house, John? Yes. They have. So they've done the heat loss calculations. Yes. And they evaluated your radiators. Yes. They yeah. were here, here for four hours. Yeah. Okay. So... It, if they're saying to you, look, here's a quote, and we're going to run the system at 45 degrees, and therefore you need to change all the radiators, that's one approach. And if that's what they've got in their kit bag, and we all tend to do this, you know, we have things that, you know, bits, we've got things we want to sell. If you'd like to see something that is competitive, that says, uh, here's an option for a high temperature heat pump, but you can keep all your radiators. Uh, clearly, then we would, you know, we would be able to help you find an installer in your area who would be able to have that conversation with you. So, if you want to pursue that route, John, drop me a note, and um, uh, we'll see if we can set you up with a with a, a smaller installer who would be able to uh, take a different, at least quote you to take a different approach. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, if the radiators are massively undersized, then you may have to change them anyway. But I would be very, very surprised if you're in a situation where um, if you had a capability of reaching 60, 65 degrees in the winter, that your existing radiators wouldn't be fine. OK, thank you okay. for your offer. All right. Any more questions from anybody? Yeah, I, I've got one. It's Mark here. Hi, Bean. Um, really informative talk. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask... Um, I've got a relatively recent sort of build project on an old house, um, but it's quite efficient, the house. I've got underfloor heating, fairly modern radiators, uh, uh, mega flow cylinder, um, and a condensing boiler that probably doesn't condense, given what you said, so I'll, I'll go and check that. Um, but um, if I was to put in a, a, a heat pump, would I need to go and change the cylinder, for example, if I've got a you know, relatively modern mega flow I, I'm, that's the bit I'm sort of struggling to understand is that some early quotes I've had suggest, yeah, you've got to replace, you know, you know, take, take out your, um, uh, take out your mega flow, put a new this in and that in, and, you know, you end up with a rather expensive quote quite quickly. And I'm, I'm struggling to understand exactly why I'd replace the mega flow. Okay. So, um, it's all about being able to transfer enough energy in a given time into the cylinder. And very crudely, that's a function of the size of the coil. Yeah. Okay. So if the, if the cylinder has a coil that was sized based on an assumed flow of 75 degrees, and you're only going to be putting 55 degrees in it, that coil may be undersized. Okay. Uh, so and the, the, the heating coil for the, for the mega flow, yeah. The coil in the, in the mega flow. Yeah. Now, um, if you don't want to replace the cylinder, you might be able to put an external heat exchanger on the outside instead. Right. Um, but, uh, but to be honest, I think, uh, you know, it's easy for you to say because it's not my money, but I think you'll be better off allowing the installer. If you've got an installer you're really happy with and you've eyeballed them and you've read our procurement <laughs> advice and you've taken all those precautions yeah. to make sure that you've not got an idiot standing in front of you. Um, 
I think you're better off letting them advise and select the cylinder because apart from anything else, it's then covered by their professional indemnity insurance. Exactly. Which yeah. means that if, you know, God forbid there was a problem with services, you'd be able to ring them up and say there's a problem with services. The risk of being of, of trying to reuse bits where no one's quite sure and, mm, is that if there's a problem, they'll turn around and say, well, we told you you should have changed your cylinder. So, uh, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, don't throw the cylinder away. Put it on eBay. Somebody will want it. Mm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mark, and um, thanks, Bean. I think we should uh, draw this to a close because it's going to be a fairly long YouTube video. But having said that, extremely interesting with a huge amount of useful information. So um, may I thank uh, not only everyone for coming along, all the people that will see this on YouTube, but most especially Mr. Bean Beanland, for his excellent talk and extremely informative talk as well. Thank you very much. If I had a clapping machine, I'd turn it on now. Yes, very good. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thanks, everybody. Bean. Yes, thank you very much, Bean. Absolutely, thank really you. enlightening. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you. Yeah. As, as I said to you, look, the key here is there's a heat pump solution for every building. It, 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 the economics might be a problem at the moment, but there is a solution for you. So um, take, if you're going to go down this route, take the precautions, do the homework. You know, there is a still a degree of caveat emptor, buyer beware here. Do the homework. If you've got any questions at all, do fire them into the Federation because we're always happy to respond to, to questions. So um, yeah, even if you get to the point where you've got a quotation and you want, you know, is this, does this look sensible? We'll always take a look for you. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody else. And uh, if I can be the first to uh, wish you happy Christmas. <laughs>